Uh, like many computer science graduates, I've always been a developer since I, gra uh, since I left school. The last company I worked for was a small one, so, multiple, uh, so people wear multiple hats. I was wearing the developer hat with my hand dipped into site reliability. That was my first exposure working in operations. When the company ran out of money, I was at a crossroad thinking about what to do next. I was looking at new opportunity that not only cornered me at coding, but also allowed me to work on the underlying infrastructure. When I accepted my current position as shared through, little did I knew I became the first DevOps. Hello, my name is Mason Leung, and this is my journey finding and learning DevOps um, and what it means in an ad tech company. The share through platform serves millions of requests daily. Some of our customers include Time Inc., CBS Interactive, and CBS Sports. We have to pay special attention when we are dealing with our infrastructure. A little mishaps can result in many, many unhappy customers. We don't have one monolithic application, but a number of micro um, services that interact with each other and manage by different engineering teams. One of the frustration when debugging was uh, debugging application log was there local in the instance. It was tedious to log into multiple instances, look for the log of interest, and then we create a timeline um, of where the error was. We thought if we could aggregate the log and make them searchable, this can greatly reduce the debugging effort. So two weeks after I started, I was tasked to look into a log aggregator. The log aggregator we ended up looking for, or looking at, was the, um, the L stack. An engineer did a, point, a proof of concept on a hack day, and we thought it would be a good candidate for experimentation. For those who are not familiar with the L stack, it is made up of Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. The application log are shipped using Logstash, tokenized with Grok filters, and stored in Elasticsearch. Kibana provides us a nice UI for log searching. We can search by IP level, uh, log level, IP, and expand to view the full log if needed. Furthermore, it has a number of great visuals. One of the engineers was using the IPs to create a heat map to visualize what most of the um, requests come from. I also try to look at different types of mobile devices that uses our SDK with a pie chart. So aside from coordinating logs, the L stack provides insights that were missed before. In this graph, we identified that every night from 8 p.m. to 8.20 p.m., there was a huge incre increase in 400 responses. Further investigation identified that a customer requesting non-existing resources during that time every single night. However, the cache time on our CDN for 400 responses was not set. We reconfigured our CDN to mitigate the impact of large-scale 400 demand. This can happen when a large customer has issue with the integration. With Elk, we were able to identify the issues and correct the integration. Furthermore, we discovered that customizing CDN setting for other classes of static resources can utilize the CDN better, and we're able to reduce the fronted request by 75% with higher cache time. This reduced the load on the origin, on the origin servers and provided us with, with more headroom. So was the log aggregator a big win? The result was mixed. We had some early return from Elk, but the maintenance was much bigger than expected, especially with Elasticsearch storage. Even though we thought it would be a great tool for debugging, it didn't get enough traction among developers. They thought the UI were, was too confusing or it didn't tokenize the log the way they, they wanted. Eventually, the L stack just fade away. So a lesson I learned from this project was, even though a tool you believe should work and gain, should be widely used, 
sometimes it failed to gain traction just because the star and the moon didn't line up, the wind didn't blow in the right directions, or the user were expecting something completely different. That is okay, because you never know what sticks until you throw it at a wall. Be prepared that you're not gonna hit a home run in your first at bat. So to an ad tech company, DevOps is to create an environment that allows failure. The second project was to improve our deployment process. Our deploy pipeline leveraged Jenkins heavily. We want to deploy small changes with, that is easy to roll back in case of problems. We want developer to push features live without the worry of stepping onto each other. We want feature flags that allow us to experiment more. Getting continuous deployment has been a top priority. We even hire a consultant to look at our pipeline and give us feedback as well as recommendation. Getting continuous deployment so although we encourage um, developer to deploy small and deploy often, there was always something that kept us from doing that. So let's take a look at our deploy pipeline. So someone would write code and then that gets ch checks into the master. Then Jenkins runs. If all passes pass, then it deploys with staging. Then sometime later, this could be hours, because this could be days when a feature needs to go live a developer would identify the changes since last deploy, post them on a Slack channel so others are notified. Then the developer deploys to production from a laptop using Capistrano. So communicating out the change to be deployed is a laborious step because it involves a lot of copy and paste and bookkeeping from a human. We need a better way. So fortunately, Capistrano is the standardized tool for all uh, application deploy. We streamlined that manual step by writing a Ruby gem that gets the last deploy from a REST API, prepare a message with the change since the last deploy, and then send it to a Slack channel. And lastly, record the deploy shard with the API. So instead of a human prepare and send a message, we would do this as part of the Capistrano deploy. Here is a sample Slack message with changes. So although we eliminated the human communications, we still have deploy that, are well over 40, that has well over 40 plus changes. So to confront this large set of deploy going out, we thought developer was simply just not sure that, um, or not aware how many commits were ready to go. So we added a deploy dashboard to show the number of commits since last deploy. The deploy score is calculated using the formula number of deploy waiting times the, the, num the hours since last deploy. The higher the score, the bigger the urgency to deploy. Anything with a deploy score of lower than 50 can wait. The developer should consider deploying for score between 50 to 100 and they should absolutely deploy now if the score is above 100. The bar graph changed color accordingly from green to yellow to red with different thresholds. And we project this dashboard on a monitor so everyone can see. So what happened next? None of the developer like to see the applications they're responsible for in red. So as soon as an application turned red on the deploy dashboard, someone in the team would do a deploy. I have even heard chatters that developer in different teams call out each other. I know that the dashboard can serve as an incentive and gradually lower the deploy threshold without telling anyone. So we were able to end up nudging developer to deploy often without asking and nagging. This turned out to be a big win for us. So now instead of seeing a deploy with 40 plus changes, we start to see deploy that are much, much smaller. So once we noticed the developer were deploying frequently, we took the plunge and let Jenkins deploy to production with small change sets. And this is what a Jenkins deploy looks now, frequent and with small changes. 
once we have Jenkins deployed to production, we went back to look at another part of the deploy process. Some of the applications built took well over 30 minutes to complete because it was only using one Jenkins process. We asked the developer to break down the test into multiple sections so they can be ran in parallel. Additionally, tests that were duplicated were removed and brittle tests were rewritten. This cuts testing from over 30 minutes to less than 10. The engineering team took time off their development cycle to improve our deployment pipeline. Improving CD takes buy-in from engineers and management. We cannot say we want continuous deployment without putting in the needed effort. It took close to four months to move our deploy pipeline to a, to a desirable state. We did not complete the CD pipeline with one giant leap, but rather with a number of small subtle changes. The deploy dashboard was built over a weekend as a toy project. Nonetheless, it was a grain of sand that tipped us over. The engineering team took time to break down and clean up the tests over several weeks to improve our build time. So to an ad tech company, DevOps is don't underestimate small changes. Our infrastructure runs mostly on Amazon. It is not uncommon to have multiple AWS accounts separated by functionality. Here is a simplified view of the share form, share form, um, share through platform. Advertiser like AppNexus, LinkedIn, would submit bits to our ad exchange to place their ad on publisher websites such as New York Times and CBS Sport. Our reporting UI shows the advertiser how much money is left for ad placement. The data processor does the bookkeeping of money spent by advertiser and money earned by the publisher. The color-coded boxes represent different AWS accounts. There is an account that is outside the platform with historical products and work as a master account for support and billing. So for a long time, this setup works because each account hosts different parts of the, of the platform. It makes billing a little bit easier to deal with and we have isolation of functionality. However, as we add more microservices to extend the capability of the platform, the number of interactions between applications grows drastically. Having seven, seven different accounts, production plus staging, starts to outweigh the original ease of manageability. So aside from growing number of interaction, there are a number of problems associated with multiple accounts. So for starter, security is a concern. Ideally, each engineer should have their own account, uh, should have their own login per account. The number of login is proportional to the number of engineers and accounts. More accounts makes bookkeeping very, very difficult. So the easy way out was one share login per account, and that is a huge, huge security risk. Aside from user management, applications running in one account may need resources like S3 in a different account. We had to maintain separate access and secret key for the applications, and this increased unnecessary bookkeeping. So we have a master account that handles billing and support. Purchasing reserve instances is, um, is done through that master account. However, this becomes an issue because US East 1A in one account may or may not map to the same US 1A in another account. We ran into cases where we thought we purchased reserved instances in an availability zone, but the zone was mapped differently in the account where the EC2 instance were instantiated. Creating support tickets was less trivial because the resource in question is often not in the master account. So it might be fun to find Waddle, but it is never fun when you have to try to locate your cloud resources at 3 a.m. in the morning during the outage. Figure out which account should host shared resources like SNS, SQS, S3 buckets when they are accessed by two or more applications was never fruitful. Lastly, separate accounts making, makes setting up VPC or virtual private cloud 
much harder, if not impossible. So those were the key reasons why we consolidate the AWS accounts. But there were, there were um, byproducts that came out of the project. So consolidation really meant to rebuild part of the infrastructure. At that stage, our company is expanding from two engineering team to five. The review process forced the developer not only to think about the code they create, but the infrastructure that it ran on. The review forced us to think about the underlying links between applications and database access. This gave new developer better understanding and seasoned developer a chance to revisit different aspects of the applications. We not only rebuilt, but we identified and shut down a number of unused resources. Developers who are normally shielded from operations were exposed to it. So once we consolidate into one AWS account, we started removing static credential in the applications, um, com in the application configuration file, and let EC2 instances assume IAM role. So the idea is to let Amazon manage the credential exchange when accessing cloud resources, so developers do not have to maintain the credential in the applications. We were able to remove 80% of the static credential from our applications with IAM role. With one account, we can finally separate lock, we can finally assign separate login to each developer. So I'll go into more about it in a bit. So was it all good? One mistake I made was being too aggressive when combining both staging and production account. In retrospective, it was probably a better idea to keep the two environments separate. It was not a fatal mistake because the number of staging resources is significantly less than production. But it does make our naming convention less ideal. Fortunately, we are moving toward VPC, so staging and production resources will be isolated. Rebuilding infrastructures force us to think, to rethink and review. The applications and, the, and underlying infrastructure were given a fresh look that otherwise would have stayed status quo. So to an ad tech company, DevOps is to rebuild often. The account consolidation projects revealed that we need better tools for building infrastructure. A lot of efforts were spent recreating resources manually. This is not only, uh, this is not only inefficient, but air prone. We need to codify our infrastructure. So for a very long time, we wrapped EC2 knife inside rig tasks to create EC2 instances. This worked, but it had a number of issues. So for starter, every time a new instance is created, library has to be recompiled from source. For example, recompiling Ruby alone for our Rails application took 10 plus minutes, and same can be said for our Scala applications uh, when we compile Java. Some resources are not even easy to. For example, Elastic Cache, RDS, et cetera. We still like a way to create them consistently with less human intervention. Security groups, IAM role, policies, and users were handled manually using the AWS console. There is no paper trail on who and what changed. Occasionally, I was there at IPs in security group trying hard to figure out who owned them. So first thing first, to deal with recompiling from source every time we bring up a new EC2 instance, we use a tool called Packer. It is a free tool from HashiCorp. So Packer takes a generic Amazon machine uh, image, um, aka AMI, and config, with, and config it with chef recipes. At the end, it outputs a shared through application specific AMI. The advantage is we only compile the source once, and subsequent EC2 instances spin up, use the application specific AMI to reduce the create time. Our applications, 
are all config with chef recipe, so adding Packer into the mix was not difficult. Additionally, Packers upload the chef recipe and environment attributes to the AMI during creation. Therefore, we only maintain one AMI per application. If we need non-production EC2, all we have to do is we run chef. So here's a sample Packer config file. You can pass in a list of AWS account that, um, that allows access to the created AP, uh, AMI. It supports other configuration management tools like Puppet and Ansible as a provisioner. One call on this file is the staging directory attribute. This is a directory that saves the cookbook used so I can reconfigure the AMI for different environments. So we also append a timestamp to the AMI for bookkeeping. AMI are region specific. If you, want to run, if you want to run an application in more than one region, multiple AMI needs to be created ahead of time. This is especially important for our disaster recovery plan. So Terraform is another tool from HashiCorp that we use to create AWS resources. It also supports other cloud resource providers like DigitalOcean and Google Cloud. We put all the Terraform file inside a subdirectory within each application. The files are organized by component. Listing that directories gives you a quick glance of what resources are needed for the applications. In the example here, this application needs Elastic Cache, ELB, RDS, S3, EC2, and SNS. This is a, just a convention that we use as shared through. Terraform does not restrict the directory structure as long as it can read it. So there are two types of Terraform file, the resource file and the state file. The resource file have a .tf extension. They specify how and what resources should be created. The state file has a, has a .tf state extension that tracks existing resources created for the application. So when Terraform runs, it loops through any files with TF extension, including subdirectories, and creates a dependency graph. If there are any tool, uh, if there are any loops in the graph, Terraform will air out. This graph is particularly useful for those who are not familiar with the application's underlying infrastructure. It provides a simple visual of resource dependencies. So here's a sample file, a sample Terraform file for creating EC2 instance. There are a couple of callouts. We don't run Chef Agent in our environment, so whenever a new package is needed for an application, a new AMI and EC2 instances are created. We label the new instance either green or blue, put it behind a load balancer and monitor for any hiccups. If part of the, if part of the platform needs refresh, we create a new set of infrastructure and gradually switch the traffic over. We can do this confidently because all components will be created correctly with Terraform. We have been using this blue-green deploy approach on high traffic applications without any issues. So for resources that are shared among different applications, for example, the subnet IDs in VPC, the security group ID, SNS topic ARN, Terraform can export them via module so other applications can import them. With module, we have consistencies across different applications. And lastly, we only create production AMI with Packer. Because Packer includes chef environment attributes in the AMI created, we can rerun chef solo with environmental specific attributes to create non-production EC2 instances during instantiation like above. And here I'm creating a staging, uh, staging instance. <clears throat> One of the Terraform option is the get command. This option is extremely valuable because it compares the Terraform file and the existing state of the infrastructure. It outputs the change that it will perform if we run it. This has helped us to detect drift in infrastructure and give us an idea what it will change. To be even more careful, the get command can output a change plan that you can run Terraform um, using that change plan, so you're absolutely sure 
what changes you are going to apply. So in the example above, a new EC2 instance will be created because a new AMI is used. So to recap, the workflow is make change to the, the um, .tf files, run Terraform plan that compares the change with the existing infrastructure ex expressed it in the .tf state file. And we manually examine the changes to be applied before running the apply command. So Terraform is great for creating new infrastructure, but our platform already exists on AWS when the tool was introduced. So how can we incorporate Terraform with an existing infrastructure? There is an open source project called Terraforming. It is a Ruby gem that talks to the AWS API and export the existing infrastructure either as a Terraform file or as a Terraform state files. Terraform files are files like the AWS instance file I showed earlier. And a Terraform state file is what Terraform used to track the current state of the infrastructure. Here is a sample state file. It is a large JSON blob. You can copy and paste the JSON blob from the exported file by terraforming into the state file generated by Terraform. So let's go to an example. So assume an application infrastructure is created by previous run of Terraform. So how can we incorporate SNS and already existed resource into this infrastructure? The first step is to run terraforming that produces two files, sns.tf and the sns.tf state files. We move the sns.tf file into the directory with the other Terraform files. Then copy and paste the, co the content from the sns.tf state file into the existing state file from previous Terraform runs. If we didn't make any mistakes, running Terraform plan would not result in any new changes. And this was how we got started with getting Terraform managing existing infrastructure. And by far, that is the easiest way to get started with the tool. So is our tool perfect? An engineer once complained Terraform was not very good because it did not remove part of the infrastructure he built. Later, I found out there was a loop in the resource dependency graph, and Terraform took the conservative route and didn't destroy the resource. So in my opinion, no tool is perfect, and Terraform has gotten us much further than any tool we've used before. It removed 80% of the manual work and it has given us consistencies and automation. I can live with the 20% work that still requires human intervention. So as mentioned before, we need separate AWS login for each developer. Aside from AWS resources, we also use Terraform for user management. AWS offers Identity and Access Management, IAM, a tool to manage user access. So here is a dependency graph generated by Terraform that shows the relationship between IAM policy, group, and a user. We started with associating a user to a group. So in this case, the user M Leung is a member of the STX engineering team. Then we attach an access policy to the STX engineering group. With a few Terraform files, we express the relationships among user, groups, and policies. Those files are checked into GitHub to prevent drift. We have a much better idea when and why a user policy was um, is added or removed by looking at the commit messages. The AWS console supports multi-factor authentication, or MFA. We like to enforce MFA during user creation. The AWS SDK can associate an IAM user with a virtual MFA, but it does not support creating such device. We had to create a virtual MFA with an in-house tool that takes advantage of the Google Chart API and the OAuth tool. Developer are required to use their own credential when accessing AWS resource. With CloudTrail enabled, we have paper trail on infrastructure change. 
we recently moved our DNS records into root 53, and our integration team need access to modify them. With separate lock-in and IAM, and IAM, we can grant them the uh, correct access. The integration team can self-serve and operation can restrict them from messing with other resources. So lastly, we were experimenting with VPC a couple months ago. I started the VPC project in US, East, US West 1 without much thought. Then I realized the cloud resource I used in US West 2 were much cheaper. I was able to change a few variables in Terraform and bring up the entire VPC infrastructure in a different region within 30 minutes. This is especially valuable during disaster recovery. So to an ad tech company, DevOps is to codify your infrastructure. So there has been a, quite a bit of tooling built around operations. We can further optimize them with more usages. Encouraging developer to experiment with them has been a high priority. So asking others to try something new is difficult. Developer might be busy, the tool might not be good enough, or the learning curve is too high. Our company highly encourage engineers to pair program. This approach innately foster knowledge sharing. It is only logical to have developer and operation pair on infrastructure work. So ultimately, engineers are smart people. Sometimes the best way to let them get operation experience is to just let go. Our client team, who work mostly with JavaScript and mobile SDK, were able to extend our platform with Elastic Container Service, a resource that is new to us. It took some hand-holding and detour at the beginning, but now they're fully capable of maintaining that part of the infrastructure. Their experience is passed back to others and serve as a reminder that engineers can do ops. Our product manager hosts weekly office hour for engineers to get business context on projects, especially those that are impactful to the company's bottom line. Our data scientists run weekly workshops, and anyone in the company who are interested in learning the experiment we are running, or just data science in general, are welcome to, um, <clears throat> are welcome to join. These types of engagement have generated a lot of knowledge sharing and provide tight feedback loops. So taking a page from our product manager and data scientist, we're developing workshops to help those who are interested in operations to learn more with the hope that they can be self-sufficient someday. The course material is still being flushed out, but it has forced me to sit back and think about operations in more of a layman term. So just a look on designing ops workshop. The keep it simple principle or KISS should always be applied. Originally, I was thinking about building a mini share through platform in the workshop, but it was way too ambitious and probably would lose half of the audience in the first five minutes. So don't make something complicated when the Hello World webpage is sufficient. Don't lose sight of the main objective that is to demonstrate the tool sets and process. So having developer and operation pair can be a huge time sink. Letting engineer build their own infrastructure can cause product delay. Preparing and running operation workshops takes a lot of time, efforts, and persistencies. But we believe they are necessary. To an ad tech company, DevOps is find a way to share knowledge so others are empowered. So what does DevOps mean to an attack company? There has been a lot of discussion about what DevOps is and isn't. Is it a process? Is it a culture? Is it repurposing sysadmin? Is it a job title? Can I get some in the marketplace? To us, as an ad tech company, DevOps is an environment that allows failure and progress with small changes. DevOps is codified everything to allow we build with less fear. DevOps is sharing knowledge and empowering others. We believe DevOps can be faster organically, and one day the dev and ops will be interchangeable. 
I hope you can find relevant information from my journey to assist yours. Thank you for your time. My name is Mason Leung, and I'm still learning DevOps at the EdTech company.